For the future is finally here. After months of speculating about what's been going on in the demon realm since Luz and her friends got trapped in the human realm. Obviously, I loved thanks to them, but I wasn't super worried about the Hexide gang. I was way more concerned about what the Collector was doing with the witches who survived the draining spell. We finally have some answers, so today I'm breaking down part two of the Owl House series finale for the future. This is your spoiler warning! If you haven't seen For the Future yet, hit pause on this video and come back when your palisman hatches. The episode opens on the moment the Titan's skull cracked open during King's Tide, just before Luz and King were separated. As soon as the portal door closes behind them, it explodes, and before he can even take a breath or gather his thoughts, King is scooped up by the Collector in a swirl of childlike magic. The Collector is so happy to be free that he feels like the whole world is singing with him. Even though he is definitely misinterpreting the screams of the terrified people trying to dodge his celebratory fireworks below. Lilith and Hootie are first to respond, and Hootie turns into a backpack helicopter, propelling Lilith like Sonic's buddy Tails, or those memes about Doduo and Dodrio flying. To shield Lilith from the Collector's magic, Hootie pulls a play out of Groot's Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1 playbook and cocoons her in his wood. When Hootie's turned into a jack-in-the-box, you'll notice that Lilith starts to fall before the Collector toyifies her. Sure, getting caught by the Collector isn't great, but if you think about it, she could have taken some serious fall damage if he didn't start levitating her. I'm guessing she didn't have her raven staff on hand either, as Hootsifer was her mode of transport. Her raven bro must have been confiscated by Terra Snapdragon when the cats got caught. So while King scolds the Collector about hurting others, you can sort of see the Collector's logic about his actions not injuring them. In fact, from his point of view, he's keeping them safe in his floating archive castle. Floating castles are a pretty fun trope, and DTVA fans recently saw one in Amphibia. These gravity-defying set pieces can make a great location for a final showdown, and you've probably played a few video games where this is exactly where the final boss is lying in wait. If you look closely, notice that Hootie's rocking a pine tree and a shooting star on his new paint job. These are subtle references to Dipper and Mabel Pines from Gravity Falls. As the Collector's shooting stars crash to Earth, Ida's Requiem slash Rain's Rhapsody plays as Ida transforms into her harpy form. Rain is totally crushing on Ida's majestic beast form, by the way. If you recall, Harpy Ida is the form Ida takes when she and the Owl Beast are in harmony, and Ida hasn't needed her elixirs to keep it in line for over half a season. So what's going on here? Well, it could just be a side effect of the draining spell breaking their bond, but more likely, I think that this is a response to the Owl Beast recognizing the Collector. Harpy Ida only starts to transform into her cursed beast form once the Collector is in eyesight, and Ida loses full control to the Owl Beast right after the Collector gets in her face. Clearly, the Owl Beast has some unresolved feelings towards the Collector after he trapped them inside of a cursed scroll. As the Collector's magic transforms the Boiling Isles, Hexide students start live pentagramming the entire experience. At Horns Not Thorns gives the Day of Unity three thumbs down and posts a picture of witches fleeing the ceremony area. Eileen, our favorite eyeball gal, says, What are those things? Hashtag weird weather. Hashtag time to panic. Hashtag bye. And her photo shows Scara, Amelia, Cat, the Bard Track Goat Cyclops, and the Beast Keeping Ugnot Kid looking out the window in terror at the Collector's robotic star shaped spies. At Friendly Neighborhood Pointy Head captioned his post, Oh my Titan, oh no, 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 no. Hashtag Hexide, hashtag Day of Unity, hashtag help. And show the fortune telling goat teacher from the Oracle Track getting caught by one of the stars. Principal Bump and the detention teacher are also fighting these celestial robots off. At Daily Knee Views shows an image of the Titan skeleton flooded with blue sparkles and shooting stars with the archives hovering above its skull, almost as if it was a crown for the Titan. Like, say, the true crown of power for the King of Demons that was teased back in the pilot? I've got some theories for this later in the video, so stay tuned. Also, notice that the crown is only half formed here. By the time Luz and her friends return to the demon realm, the crown's missing pieces are completed. The Collector seems to be repurposing matter from the Isles to make his castle. So while they seem to have limitless power, it appears that they might be bound by some laws of physics, such as the conservation of mass. During the scene transition, the Owl House logo is collectorified, changing the previously golden words to pink, and the owl symbol is now half purple, half gold. As our heroes return to the demon realm, the witches explain to Camilla that the Lisa Frankification of the Boiling Isles definitely isn't normal. While exploring the abandoned Owl House, we see graffiti on the outside that reads, There is no Titan. The Emperor's Coven was here. Kiss my grass. Bad word. Owls are dumb. And a red face with a tongue sticking out. Did this kid do all the tagging? What's your graffiti stand for? Uh, it's graffiti stands for...
Also, I loved the not cool written on Ida's freezer. The rest of the house is trash too. The stained glass eye window in Ida's bedroom has a hole through it, and someone knocked over the greatest family photo in existence. Eee, I love the matching 80s sweaters almost as much as I love King's grumpy little face. Look at him, what an angry baby. When the gang hesitates to say Bellos' name a few moments later, Hunter explodes, chastising them saying, oh come on, it's not like a swarm of ghosts will inexplicably appear if you say his name, making a dig against the whole saying the name Voldemort is bad luck thing. It breaks my heart when he hears a crackling branch and instinctively reaches for his staff. Flapjack was already so much a part of him, he's still going through the motions of having them around. Hunter sees who he thinks are King and Ida on the back of the collector shooting star, and the gang heads to the deserted marketplace in Bonesboro. We see that the sleigh ground has been smashed up. Here we find more graffiti such as Boo Bellows, Help Us Mr. Titan, and the shout out to Bibsy, a recurring background character from Amphibia. There's a sign that used to say Day of Unity that now has the words do not and a frowny face drawn, along with a low mustache on the Emperor's mask. We also see another Boo Bellos, a hide, a run coven, a hide your kids reference, a they'll find you, hide, run, a boarded up door that says nope, no, go away, a shop that's closed forever, and the collector symbol. Then there's Beware the Collector, Where's Your Titan Now, Go Away, and a classic Stooshie. One of the most heartbreaking pieces is the one looking for Cat and Amelia, signed by Old Three Eyes herself, Basha. A blue wave of sparkles washes over the town square, and we finally see why Dana tweeted the word sparkles to sum up the episode. Think of these sparkles like Wanda's hex in WandaVision. Like the Scarlet Witch, the Collector is using his magic to create his own version of reality. Instead of making the Boiling Isles a giant hodgepodge of sitcoms, however, he's transforming the town and its citizens into puppets and playthings storing their bodies and consciousness in the archive when he's not using them to play pretend. As we learned from the citizens of Westview, being under Wanda's spell was actually an incredibly torturous experience. Likewise, when we see Hootie partially broken from his toy coma later on in the episode, he confirms that being archived is like being sequestered in a darkness like unto death. Both Wanda and the Collector have created these alt realities for themselves to avoid feeling the pain of loss. For Wanda, it was Vision's death, and for the Collector, it was being locked away in solitude and then subsequently betrayed by Bellows. The Collector is really into playing with his best friend King, as they reenact stories King has shared with the Collector about Luz. In this instance, it's the time that Luz was able to subdue the Owl Beast with her light glyph. If you check out the chalk drawings in this scene, you can see that the Collector's love of King goes deep. There are simple drawings of the pair in several locations, and even one of Owl Beast Ida. I also think that it's interesting that the hopscotch board is missing a proper number 8. My headcanon is that it looks too similar to the symbol for infinity for the Collector's liking, and that's a really long, lonely concept that they've grown to despise while locked up. This scene also gives us a few video game references. The animal that Terra Snapdragon uses as her Ida wig is clearly a pink Sonic the Hedgehog, and the star that the Collector travels on is taken straight out of Kirby. After running into a band of survivors, Metholomew, Skara, and Barkus appear to take everyone back to New Hexide to catch them up on what they've missed while they've been gone. Obviously, the most important thing is that Metholomew is now man -tholomew. This scene gives us a clearer look at the Collector's spies, as they capture witches and demons for his archive. The designs of these monsters seem to take inspiration from both the Moon and Majora's Mask from Zelda, one of the crew's favorite video game franchises. Like the rest of the Isles, New Hexide is trashed. We've got a no-non puppet sign on the door, abomination slime covering the school logo, kindergartner turf graffiti, a leave or die sign and kids in hammocks above the door, platform beds hung on walls, kids literally swinging from the ceiling, and a sign that reads, days since major injury, zero. Also, did this kid murder the choosy hat? These young witches have also set up New Hexide Market for buying and trading goods, like these t-shirts that say Bellos, more like Belch Gross with a puking emperor, Collect This with a thumbs down emoji, and the collector's image crossed out, I survived the day of unity and all I got was this lousy t-shirt, and a second collector's symbol thumbs down Collect This. One of the cool details here is that Eileen is working the baked goods table, and we saw that this Potion Coven's gal is also a proud member of the Cooking Coven back in Covention. It does make you wonder though if that moldy bread she's selling is filled with paper clips. 
My favorite part of Hexide's makeover, however, is that sweet, sweet Princey B statue. I love that the half pipe is made out of the maw of a demon, his sick ass wallet chain, and that his board has a pizza decal on it. Despite all of Man Thalamuel and Gerbo's attempts to make new Hexide operate more smoothly, President Basha has other plans. As the fresh leader of these left behind students, she's taking most of her advice from Mickey and Rosha, aka Kikimura and her Obamatron, who also survived the Day of Unity. Basha sits under a banner that reads, New Hexite is the future, flanked by the new logo of the school, Grudge Be Balls with Basha's Eyes. Lol, that's like if I took over my high school and made the mascot a book with Coke bottle glasses. <laughs> she also has a Grudge Be Ball next to her on the throne and Grudge Be Trophies at her feet. In the background, we also see that one of Basha's guards looks suspiciously like Anne from Amphibia. She's got witch ears to fit in, but her silhouette is too close not to be a cameo. And look, I've already seen a lot of hate for Basha's actions online. I get it, she's a bully and her intended arc seems to feel rushed thanks to Disney reducing the show's third season. But at the same time, I can actually really empathize with where she's coming from. We've got a real Lord of the Flies situation on our hands. This is a group of traumatized kids doing their best to survive. Everything that Basha does stems from a place of fear. Not only were her parents likely affected by the draining spell, her friends Amelia and Kat were turned into dolls right before her eyes. She has no way of knowing if any of them are safe or even alive. And that graffiti shows that she's been haunted by losing them. Also, later in the episode when she speaks to Willow, she states that she believes that leaders can never show weakness because if they do, everything will unravel. Basha, like a jock stuck in her high school glory days, can't handle her world changing. And because she refuses to show weakness, her response to the Collector's chaos is to bury her head in the sand. All Basha wants is for things to go back to how they were pre-Day of Unity. And she even tells Amity as much when she begs her to come back so that things can return to the way they were. Silently lonely, terrified, and looking for easy solutions, it makes sense that she turned to the first authority figure who outlined a plan for her personal safety and a return to normalcy. Kiki made Basha believe that the only way to make things normal again was if she did everything that Kiki told her to do. So while I can agree that her actions were selfish, greedy, and toxic, ultimately Basha's still a scared kid being exploited by a power-hungry adult. Kiki more is a devious one too. She's not taken over directly. Instead, she's utilizing Basha's status as top dog of Hexide to pull the strings from the sidelines. Willow has been struggling with her emotions in this episode too. She's like a green Elsa with all the conceal don't feel she's pulling this up. She's taken on the role of the group's caretaker and the pressure of being strong, reliable Willow is taking its toll. Caregiver burnout is unfortunately a common occurrence. When you're used to taking care of everyone else, you can forget to let yourself feel your own feelings. Willow's arc this episode is meant to teach us how imperative and important it is to let your loved ones help you carry your burden. No witch is an island, dude! Even if you're the strongest person that your friends and family know, you don't have to lift something as heavy as this alone. Willow is pushed to her limit by seeing her dad puppeted by the Collector. And after seeing her own photo memories from the season one episode Understanding Willow, she only misses her father's even more. Matholomew and Gerbo have set up a hidden bunker to plan how to fix President Basha's messed up ruling system, and Willow sees several of the gang's memories hung on a bulletin board in the lab. From understanding Willow, we see young Luz, young Willow feeding a carrot to a demon cow, young Willow and Amity hugging on Amity's birthday, Willow opening holiday gifts with her dads, and Willow on the swing set with her dads. From the day that the witches played Flyer Derby, we see a picture of Viney glaring at Gerbo that says traitor, because if you recall, he joined Professor Homunculus' derby team instead of hers. There's also pictures of Willow, Gus, and Clover post-victory that says, eat it, we won, as well as solo pictures of Clover and Puddles, camera-shy Professor Homunculus, and Scara, the team strategist. Before diving into Luz's memories to find an image of Bello drawing the teleportation glyph, Willow says this call back to Luz. No schemes, no plots, no ruses, and definitely no shenanigans. Back in Season 1, Episode 15, Luz sees the memory of Amity and Willow hugging and decides to start plotting a way to parent trap them into being friends again. Willow declines and tells her no schemes, no plots, no ruses. But because she never says no shenanigans, Luz takes that as permission to pull some. But like Willow, Luz is also feeling a lot of pent-up anxiety and guilt about the role she's played and all of the terrible things that have happened in the Boiling Isles with Bellos and the Collector. Everything she blames herself for comes through in her photo memories. The first pic shows Luz choosing to stay in the Demon Realm from a Lying Witch and a Warden, because Luz truly feels that if she had never come to the Demon Realm, Ormet, King, Ida, Hootie, and all of their friends, her loved ones would be safe right now. 
The second photo shows Luz sneaking in to steal Amity's training wand and Magic 101 book in Adventures in the Elements. Not only did her petty burglary result in a slither beast attacking them, that was also the day that she discovered how to spot an ice glyph in the falling snowflakes. She feels that if she hadn't continued learning and teaching glyph magic, she never would have taught Philip Wittebane how to make that light glyph, aka the catalyst for his journey to become Emperor Bellows. We see an image of her teaching Philip the light glyph in picture 5, which I'd argue is the thing she feels most guilty about of all. We also see Luz coming to Ida's aid from Agony of a Witch, moments after she surrendered to Lilith and Bellos and gave in to her curse. Then we have Luz saying goodbye to Camilla in her astral projection form in Yesterday's Lie, Bellos explaining to Hunter that wild magic wasn't what killed their family, it was actually him all along, King being pulled away from Luz at the end of King's Tide, the Grom transforming into the personification of Camilla's perceived disappointment in Luz, and finally Philip drawing the portal glyph that transports him, Lilith, and Luz to the Titan's skull. Luz marvels at how clear the images are, which is likely due to how strong her feelings of guilt are regarding these memories. Willow tries to gift Hunter the image of him and Flapjack from the day they kicked ass at Flyer Derby, but she interprets that her gift only upsets him more. She finally breaks down, fleeing the room. Unfortunately, Basha and Mickey decide to strike, revealing the true identities of Kiki Mora and her Abomatron. They knock the gang out with a sleeping nettle potion, and Kiki throws them into the detention pit. The witches attack the Abomatron when Basha locks Kiki Mora inside the pit with them, but when Camilla tries her hand at drawing an ice glyph, she accidentally causes an explosion. The walls collapse around them, separating the group, but don't worry. Camilla makes up for her error. Kiki Miki! Uh, Bruja Toss! Kiki Miki! Bruja Toss! is so funny. Okay. Bruja means witch or sorcerer in Spanish, and I love Mama Noceda's human take on a spicy toss. Basha runs into Mytholomew and Amity in the tunnel and turns to the next closest person that she views as a leader, her former best friend. She begs her to come back, be a part of the Grudgeby team, and help her really transform Hexide into something better. But Amity stands her ground, refusing to join Basha's reign, and instead offers her a place in the fight against the Collector. In the little skirmish between Mytholomew, Basha, and Amity, we get a tell that an illusion swap has taken place early on in the fight. Disguised Amity is using her purple abomination magic. In another chamber, Willow's anxiety is manifested by sprouting uncontrollable vines that end up trapping Gus and Hunter. Gus lets her know that it's okay to feel stressed. They can handle it, and they'll be there for her like she's been there for them countless times before. But after hearing her call herself half a witch Willow, Hunter's body begins to glow gold, and in a glowing burst of light, he speeds through the vines and snatches Willow out. I am fully shipping them, especially because of how cute it was when she and Hunter linked pinkies and the way he full body blushed when Willow tells him that he means a lot to her. He zips her and Gus to safety, and holy shit, you guys, Hunter has magic powers! Suck it, Bellows! This Grimwalker wasn't a failure! He has actual internal powers without having a bile sack. Unheard of in the demon realm. Willow concludes that it must be the magic of Flapjack inside of him, which is A, adorable, and B, exactly the upgrade Bellows was going for by eating all those palismen. Instead of being given the gift of a palisman's powers, he carelessly stole their lives, murdering thousands. And look where that got him! He's just a slimy pile of goop and rotting bones, and the body of his last Grimwalker won't even accept his effed up new form. It does help him grow his arms and legs back though. Like the palisman souls he drank like his daily Starbucks, the souls of all the Grimwalkers he slayed are haunting him too. This time, he can't make the mirage of Caleb with a bloody dagger hovering over his head go away. This imagery invokes the Greek story of the Sword of Damocles, in which a king hung a sword above his throne by a strand of horsehair. The sword was a symbol of the dangers and pressures he faced while in power, and the blood that stained his hands to retain it. This sword left those who sat in his throne with a looming sense of dread, making them feel like they were one wrong move away from death. There's also a floating phantom dagger that Macbeth sees in Act Two of Shakespeare's Macbeth before he murders and replaces his cousin as the King of Scotland. Macbeth follows the illusory dagger to King Duncan's chambers and views it as a cue to act on his foretold fate of becoming the king, even if it meant he must betray his own blood. 
Once Macbeth commits the murder, the illusory knife becomes bloodstained to symbolize his guilt. Here, this vision of Caleb is Belos' own Macbethian Sword of Damocles, a manifestation of the atrocities that put him into power and the foreboding sense of impending death. Interestingly, the dagger itself is the one he appears to have murdered Caleb with, and that same dagger without the blood is in Belos' science lab. But before we dive into everything about Belos, the Collector and King, we gotta talk about Luz's new palace man! Luz and her mom have a heart-to-heart -heart about failure, and Camilla takes Gus and Willow's advice from earlier in the episode, telling her daughter about all the times that she's felt like a failure too. Camilla also tells her about the astral oath between Cosmic Frontier's Captain Avery and his family, revealing that she's also a huge nerd to Luz for the first time. When Luz confesses that the only thing she's ever truly wanted is to feel understood, her palisman hatches. The bad news is, her palisman hatching gives away their location to Kikimora, who is hunting them after they used an invisibility glyph to escape. The good news is, Basha and the Human Appreciation Society take her down, giving Luz and the gang just enough time to use Belos's glyph to teleport to the Titan's decaying eyeball. I love that Camilla is finally leaning into her nerdy fandoms, saying this to a very excited Gus and Hunter. Well, you really beamed us up, eh, old Bailey? <gasps> this is, of course, a reference to Star Trek's Beam Us Up, Scotty. My absolute favorite part of the episode is the sweet little fan shout out that the writers included just for us. They knew we've all been guessing what Luz's palisman will turn into, and all of her friends' guesses were the exact same ones we've all been talking about for years. And I can't believe that her palisman is a cute little serpent, a snake shifter! Man, it truly was right in the logo this entire time. I love that String Bean has the ability to hybrid up with any animal it chooses. It's like, what if Luz's mashup taxidermy animals were alive? Of the forms it takes in this episode, we've got a bat, a scorpion, and a Chinese dragon. While its base form is mostly a snake, it has the same cat ears as Luz's favorite hoodie. String Bean is the most precious thing in any realm, and I will die for her. She's also a perfect symbol of Luz's creativity and desire to dabble in everything. But lurking above all those sweet baby palismen are Bellos and the Collector, which means it's time to back up and talk about everything that went down in the B-plot this up. Ever since we were introduced to the Collector, we've all been debating how menacing of a villain he'll be. Although he's an ancient being older and more powerful than even Bellos, this episode makes it clear that the Collector is still a little kid emotionally. While he's certainly a dangerous antagonist who is incredibly disconnected from mortal reality, we also see that he's not necessarily an evil entity. So, like Hunter, Lilith, Amity, and now Basha, there's a good chance that Luz and her friends can sway his heart with empathy. Obviously, this task seems to have fallen on King, who has become more or less a cosmic babysitter. But that won't be an easy task. For starters, he's so far removed from humble mortals that he struggles to even understand what we eat. One of my favorite bits of dialogue from this episode is when the Collector offhandedly assumes that we have the power to eat something as intangible as gravity. They're so nonchalant about it, it makes you wonder how pliable the laws of physics are to them. But what makes this even funnier is that they have a soft spot for pizza bagels. That's right, folks, bagel bites are a truly transcendent cuisine. When the Collector heads to bed for the night, we see that they've created a pocket dimension with their godly powers, and they pull out a book literally as large as a day on this planet is long. This book gives us some pretty big insights into the Collector's backstory. The unedited text of the book reads, Collectors live long, we watch things pass, to preserve, to observe, we must amass. What flies, what swims, be it predator or prey, seal them up so that they'll never fade. But should they meddle in our affairs, we'll clean the planet and scorch the air. Basically, this tells us that in addition to being a godlike cosmic race, the Collector's culture revolves around capturing creatures from across the universe and magically trapping them for their collections. They're essentially historians keeping a living record of all creatures they come across. Sort of like my fiancé and his living Pokedex. Are we the baddies? And while at first they seem like an impartial presence like Marvel's The Watcher, they actually will go Old Testament on those that somehow stop their collections from being complete. The whole line about cleaning the planet and scorching the air makes me think that possibly the boiling sea wasn't always boiling, and that this was the result of the Collector's clash with the Titans. This passage is followed by an image that looks strikingly similar to the ones Bellos utilized in his propaganda, and it depicts a group of mortals making offerings to the Collectors. My reading is that in addition to hunting down creatures like we saw a collector do with the Owl Beast, they would go planet to planet and tax the inhabitants. If their sacrificial offerings were satisfactory, they'd leave with minimal damage. 
but if they found the offerings lackluster, they would go scorched earth on the mortals. It is interesting that the collector is not very fond of that last part and this illustration, and chose to scratch it out and replace it with, playing is more fun, make friends instead, and the others stink, boo. This seems as if the collector actually rebelled against their parents in protest to any cruelty to the collector's potential friends. We also get fragments of words from the other half of this book's spread. Of the words that we can make out, dimensional shows up frequently, which points towards the collectors being multidimensional entities, which could mean that they have the power to traverse realms without portal tech or titan's blood. There are other fragments that Reddit user Kayena beat me to decoding. Most interesting to me is the potential of there being an Eclipse Queen, who's likely the Collector's mother and the ruler of these gods. If we ever get a proper flashback, this Eclipse Queen would be my guess for the narrative foil to King's father in the Collector vs. Titans War. Also, I'm curious if this has any ties to Eclipse Lake, a location that I desperately want to revisit. Other words that can be made out on this page are potential and family, but without more context, it's hard to predict what these mean. Perhaps the biggest clues to this Collector vs. Titan conflict comes from the hallway of the archives that are decorated similarly to the ones in Emperor Bellos' mindscape. Here, each panel tells a different fragment of ancient history. But before we piece this story together, I think it's important to remember that according to Lilith's research, Titan magic cancels out Collector magic and can be deadly to these otherwise immortal beings. So with that established, let's unravel this mystery. Either on a whim or as part of a coming-of-age trial, the Collector found themselves on the Demon Realm's planet. It's unclear as to whether the Collector brought attention to the Demon Realm to their elders, or if this was part of their planetary tax tour. But either way, the Collectors found that the Titans put up a fight and could put fear of death into these immortal beings. Instead of leaving the planet B, they found it necessary to erase the Titans from existence and turn to subterfuge to hunt them down. By blending in as Titans like we saw back in Edge of the World, they were able to lure Titans into traps and hunt them to extinction. At some point, the Collector found a group of child Titans who they saw as friends. This likely drove a wedge between the Collector and their elders, who were bent on the complete genocide of Titans. As the war rages on, it eventually threatened the last egg of the Titans, King's Egg. Somehow, in a climactic fight, both the Titans and the Collectors were wiped out, King's Egg was hidden away in a tower invisible to Collectors thanks to a glyph, and the last of the Collectors were trapped in the in-between realm, likely using similar magic that the Collectors used to trap their specimens. All of this is to say that King and the Collector are potentially both the last of their kind due to a generational grudge between their cultures. When the young generation sought peace, the elders only saw conflict. Comparing this to how Philip and Caleb Wittabane were raised by witch hunters, or how the Isles were broken up into coven witches versus wild witches, you can start to see a recurring theme of the show. Hatred is taught, but empathy can bring us together and make the world better. The other side of the hallway is more puzzlingly abstract. It shows celestial imagery such as a moon, sun, and shooting star, and planetary alignment. Long ago, I theorized that King's ancestors built his temple to utilize magic associated with planetary alignment to magnify their powers, and I think that this might be what's being shown here. We know that the Day of Unity needed power from an eclipse to work, so I'm wondering how much of a power boost comes with a full planetary alignment. The jury's out on this though, so let me know what you think this all means. But speaking of structural obelisks of power, I feel like the Collector's archive appearing like a crown above the Titan's skull isn't a coincidence. This show loves to go full circle, and the first thing we learned about King is that he supposedly was a massive king of demons who lost his power when his crown was stolen. Part of me wonders if the Collector's castle could be a contortion of this story. Could the crown resurrect the Titan if placed upon its head? Could Puppet Bellows possess the crown and use it to take control of the Titan's corpse, giving us a kaiju battle climax? Could it be shrunk down and put onto King's head by the Collector as a symbol of peace, coronating him as the sworn lord of the demon realm? All I know is that this castle is gonna end up on someone's head. Speaking of my off-the-wall theories, let's talk about Luz's moment in the in-between realm at the start of the episode. As she wakes up, she briefly sees a glowing figure on the other side of the realm. Flipping the image and enhancing it shows that we're looking at a winged titan, or another titan trapper. But they're trying to close up the plot, not introduce new mysteries, so I'm gonna go with my gut on this one. I've got two theories as to who this is. The obvious one is that this is the spirit of King's father, the titan. Back when I first heard the whispering in Yesterday's Lie, I theorized that this could have been the titan talking to Luz. 
We since were led to believe that what we heard was the Collector, but it actually makes more sense that the Titan was leading Luz through the realm. We've seen that the in-between realm can use reflective surfaces to communicate with the demon in human realms, and it's been implied that the spirit of the Titan has been purposefully helping Luz. Perhaps King's dad has been watching Luz from the windows in the in-between realm, and is using the quirks of this realm as a means of providing guidance to Luz. If this is the case, I wouldn't be surprised if Luz or King make contact with the spirit right before the show's climax. My other theory is a little wilder and I don't think it's as likely, but it's still fun to think about. We know that King's dad died much larger than this spirit appears to be. Now, I've talked about how I feel like the time traveling elements of this series feel like they need to make a comeback in the finale. So I'm wondering if what we're seeing isn't King's dad, but an older version of King himself. He appears older here because he's been doing some time pull shenanigans. As we move further into the finale though, I'm starting to feel like another time traveling plot is off the table, but with so many unanswered questions about the past, including the Collector nabbing the Owl Beast to the Titan and Collector War, Philip's betrayal at Eclipse Lake, and Evelyn's connection to the Clawthorns, I'm still holding out hope that we'll get some answers via time travel. In my ideal world, this future version of King would be a cliffhanger that leaves potential for a spin-off series following King and a new generation of witches. I know that Dana's more interested in a young Ida and Rain spin-off, but hey, a girl can dream, can't she? Speaking of Rain, I know a large portion of the internet thinks that they're showing death flags and might make a big sacrifice when Ida confronts Puppet Bellows. I'm just gonna say I doubt it. Rain has been such a key representative for non-binary people that I know for certain that the Owl House team isn't gonna fridge them. That's an old ass reductive trope, and the Owl House avoids those like the plague. So rest easy fans, Rain's gonna be okay. But I'm not gonna be okay. We only have one episode of our favorite show left, and while I can't wait to see how all of these mysteries finally unravel, I'm really gonna miss the Boiling Isles. But my sadness that this series is ending is outweighed only by my desire to see King interact with Stringbean for the first time. It's gonna be so cute. Let me know what questions you still have going into the finale. I wanna hear your thoughts about For the Future in the comments section. I'm Scarlet Lit, and you're watching Whitney Vision.